We're returning to a series that we do periodically that is quite simply called, Is That in the Bible? I'll tell you where the seed thought for this came from originally, and I got to put this in quotes. There was a quote attributed to Abraham Lincoln that said, the problem with quotes found on the internet is that they are often not true. (laughs) You get it? For some of you, that may take a while to sink in, but Abraham Lincoln never said that, but it's wise. And so it sounds like it goes with honest Abe. You know, there's some statements that people hear sometimes and go, boy, those have got to be in the Bible because it sounds biblical. And we've discovered in this series that sometimes those things aren't. But you know what? There's also on the other side, there's some phrases that you go, that couldn't possibly be in the Bible, could it? And it turns out that it is. So this is what we're exploring in this series. There's a sportswear company that's called Active Faith. I have one of their warm-up sweatshirts that I wear frequently when I'm getting ready to exercise. And on the front, it says down in big letters, I can do all things. And then when I turn around on the back of the shirt, it says through Christ. And so that's the one that we want to explore first. I can do everything through Christ Jesus. Is that found in the Bible? Well, this is one of those ones that we have to say, yes, but. It is in the Bible, but what does the word everything mean? I can do everything through Christ. I can do everything. Think about what is comprised in everything. I don't think that Paul meant anything that I want to do, anything that I want to attempt, because there's some things that are illegal, dangerous, immoral, or flat out wrong according to the bible doesn't mean that i can do those things in christ jesus so we have to explore what is meant by that word everything as we've discovered before context is king if we really want to know what that verse is saying we have to begin to zoom out and look at the context in which that phrase appears what is happening in the verses right around it what is happening in that whole book that is giving us some clues to the context to make sure that we understand. Now, it it does say here in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, these are the actual words that I'm reading out of the New International Version of the Bible, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. But let's put it in context a little bit. So I want to back up just a couple of verses to verse number 10 of chapter 4, where Paul says this, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Now, this whole letter to the church at Philippi is um, a lovely letter. Paul clearly has great affection for the Philippian Christians. He begins his letter by saying this, every time that I think of you, I burst into praise for you and I give thanks to God for you because you've been a partner with me in ministry right from the very beginning. As soon as I came to Macedonia, as soon as I came to the city of Philippi and I shared the good news about Jesus and you believed that, You have been partners with me right from the very beginning. In fact, so much so that when he's writing to the church at Corinth, he actually uses this church as an example. He says this to the Corinthians, And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Philippi would have been a city in that Macedonia region. Out of the most severe trial and their overflowing joy, their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. So clearly, they had supported Paul in his ministry. But what Paul's saying here in verse number 10 When he says, I rejoice now that you have renewed your concern for me, this whole letter uh, to the church at Philippi is written from prison. Now, prison, as we think of it today, was a little bit different. Now, there there are times that some people are thrown into a, what we, we might call a dungeon, where it's a dark, dank place, and they might be locked into stocks and have chains on them, and they couldn't move anywhere. But Paul was most likely under house arrest, which meant that 
He could move about the house. He just couldn't move out of the house. The guards would have kept anybody from, uh, kept him from leaving the house. Now, they often would have guests, and sometimes the guests would even live with them. But that prisoner, Paul in this case, was entire, entirely responsible for his own expenses. So if he didn't have money, he didn't eat. He didn't get clothes that he needed or maybe medicine or, or, or different supplies. He needed to have financial support, financial means to be able to pay for that. And so it sounds like the Philippian church, uh, who had been supporting his ministry, when they became aware that he was in prison under this house arrest and that he had need for finances, that they said, we want to take care of this. In fact, he explains a little bit further on in that same fourth chapter, he says, yes, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again. They, they were constant givers again and again when I was in need. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. And listen how he describes the gifts. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. So Epaphroditus uh, was the one who took the money from this church at Philippi to, uh, or to Paul in prison, probably in Rome. And um, while he was there, in fact, Epaphroditus even became sick. Paul talks about it in chapter two. He says, Epaphroditus became ill. And he says, boy, it weighed heavy on my heart because I would have hated if he would have brought this gift from you to minister to me and then would have died as a result of this journey. But he says, but God gave him grace and gave me grace too and helped Epaphroditus recover. And, and Paul then says in this letter, I'm sending Epaphroditus back to you. In fact, Epaphroditus very likely could have been the one that carried this letter with him back to this church. And so we see the involvement that this church has. And that's the part of the context that we get for understanding this phrase, I can do everything through him who gives me strength, is this whole idea of Paul in prison and a church supporting him. So Paul is in a not happy place. He's not flush with cash, but he says, now I've, I've been given enough. So let's go back to verse number 10 again, and we're going to hear these verses leading up to this statement that we're considering. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity, uh, no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. And now here comes our verse. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. So clearly the everything that Paul is talking about here in context is not just saying I can do whatever I want to do, because if that's true, then why was he in prison? If I can do everything that I want, I'll just walk out of these prison doors right now. But what he was saying is, I can live in a place of contentment regardless of what is going on. Look at contentment, Paul says. In fact, he uses it twice here. It's a learned thing. He says, I have learned to be content. And then he says, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Contentment is learned when things are going well, that we're content with that situation. Think about it. When things are going well, we're not saying, well, okay, I have some good things, but I want more. That's not contentment. Contentment is saying, I have some good things. And so he says, I know what it is to have plenty. I, I've, I've learned contentment even in that situation. But contentment is also learned when there's a need. He also says, I know what it is to be in need in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, living in plenty or in want. I've learned contentment. Contentment is a learned attitude. And I think for a lot of us, it's an attitude that has to be relearned because we're content in a situation. Maybe we're content when we have plenty. 
we're not in need. And so we can say, hey, I've learned contentment because my wants, my appetites have been satisfied. And then something happens. Things go sideways. Things go fall apart. Things go down. And sometimes we have to relearn contentment to say, you know what? Can I be content even when appetites are thwarted? Can I still say I can do everything through him who gives me strength? Does he give me strength in the good times? Well, yeah, that's, that's easy to, to say. Does he give me strength in the times of need? Yes, but I sometimes have to relearn that contentment. Let's back up a few more verses. Remember, Paul is writing this letter from prison. And he says in chapter 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And in case you weren't quite clear, he says it again. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. When you're in that place of need, rejoice. And then with thanksgiving, with anticipation of the provision, make your request known to God. And then he says, here's the result. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to see how that verse, verse number seven, how it connects to verse number 13. They, they, they tie right into each other. Let me, let me read them together here. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I can do everything through him who gives me strength because he's given me the peace. He's helped me learn contentment. So when Paul says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength, what he's saying is when I'm in a place of need, when I'm in a place where discontentment starts to come in, and maybe that discontentment begins to create in me some anxiety, some worry, and I catch myself Oh, I'm starting to wring my hands over this. I'm starting to worry, am I going to have enough? What about tomorrow? How's this going to be? Paul says, I'm going to say this to you. Rejoice in the Lord, not just when things are good, but rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And when I see that I have a need, I need to remind myself, the Lord is near. And so I don't have to be anxious. I can make prayers and petitions out of my needs. And with thanksgiving, I can present them to God, knowing that then his peace is going to come in and that now I'm going to learn the contentment and I'm going to learn that I can do everything in this place of contentment through Christ Jesus, who gives me strength. I want you to listen to that verse 13 out of the Amplified Bible. I like this translation. It says this, I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal to anything. How? Not through his own strength, but through him who infuses inner strength into me. And this last phrase is great. I like this one. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. In other words, I can do it, not because somehow I figured it out and I developed the strength to do it. I only have sufficiency because I'm in Christ's sufficiency. Do you hear that, that word in? He says, this peace will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. You see, here's what this contentment does for us. Contentment keeps Jesus in my focal point, keeps Jesus my same focus, regardless, as, as Paul says here, whether I'm in need or whether I have plenty. I keep saying, if I have plenty, Jesus supplied it all. If I'm in need, Jesus can supplied, supply what I need. So contentment is assuring me or reassuring me that my God will supply, that I can keep my eyes there, that he will give me the strength in plenty or in need to keep my focus there. But I think the other thing that's very important about contentment 
is it puts us in a place where we can intercede for other people. Let me, let me show you what I mean. And let's make this a second part of asking this question. Is that in the Bible? Here's another phrase that I wonder sometimes if people think it's in the Bible. My God shall supply all my needs according to the glorious riches of Christ Jesus. Is that in the Bible? No, it's not. This isn't even a yes, but. That phrase is not in the Bible. Let me read it for you as it actually is in the Bible. It's right here in this same passage in Philippians chapter 4, right after he says, thank you for sending this gift from Epaphroditus. Your gifts are a sweet aroma to God. It's a sweet smelling sacrifice, not given to me, but given to God. But it's met my need then through the riches. And so it says this, and my God will meet all your needs. Not my needs. My God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. See, he's already said, I know what's going to happen when I've, I've learned this about contentment. That when I start to lose my contentment and anxiety starts to come in, I say, I need to rejoice in the Lord. I need to take the anxious thoughts and with prayer and petition and thanksgiving, make my requests. I need to know that his peace is going to come in and that he is going to give me the strength to do everything that I need to in this time of plenty or need because I'm depending on Jesus. And now because I'm in that place, guess what I get to do for others? Because let me ask it to you this way. When you are at a place of discontentment, how easy do you think it is to pray for other people's needs? I can speak for myself. It's not very easy to do. When I'm in need, it's really hard for me to turn my prayers out to pray for other people who are in need. Because I keep wanting to add something on to, to my prayers. I keep wanting to say, Lord, bless them. Oh, yeah, and me too. I want to bring it back. So, it's not, and my God will supply all my needs. Paul already said, they've already been supplied. I know what it is to stand in this strength that he gives. I already know what it is to have these sweet-smelling sacrifices that have come through your hands, but ultimately God provided it. And so now I am in a place of contentment to be able to intercede for you. Because God has supplied my needs, I can now pray for him to supply your needs. Because I've experienced how he brings this provision and this sufficiency to me, now I can pray for you to have that as well. Listen to um, the this kind of circle that, that goes around. Paul writes this again to the Corinthians, but this time in his second letter, he says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us, where? In all our troubles. Not by removing troubles from us, but in all of our troubles. Where did we hear that word in? The peace of God will come in when I'm in Christ Jesus. The strength that I need is through Christ Jesus. Okay, He says here, in the middle of our troubles, he comforts us. But then listen to these next words, so that. So why does God comfort, comfort us? Let me personalize it. Why does God comfort me? So that I can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort I myself have received from God. You see, friends, God's blessings of provision are not primarily for you. They are primarily through you to other people. See, when Paul says, I felt the pangs of anxiety start to come in, I felt a little discontentment, and so I rejoiced in the Lord. I rejoiced because I could look back and see in my history how he's provided before. And so now I could say, God is near, and so I'm going to not be anxious about any of these things, but with 
prayer and petition and thanksgiving. I'm going to make my requests known to God, and then I'm going to feel his peace come as I stay in Christ Jesus. And then I'm going to be able to say, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And now that I'm in that place of having received his comfort and his peace, that I'm learning this contentment, now I can pray for you in your needs and say, my God, will supply all your needs, just like he supplied mine. And so I can pray with faith, believing for you, my God will supply all your needs according to the glorious riches. And there's that preposition again, in Christ Jesus. Because you know what? There's going to be a time down the road where things are going to go badly for me. And I'm going to maybe have those doubts a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of discontentment that's start, going to start coming in. And now these people that I just interceded for that are at a place of peace and contentment and assurance in the strength of Jesus, now they can say, hey, since I've been comforted, I can now give some comfort to you. I can pray for you. And they're going to pray the same prayer right back for me. My God shall supply all your needs according to the glorious riches in Christ Jesus. So friends, let's make sure that we keep these promises in their proper context. I can do everything through Christ Jesus. Doesn't mean whatever I want to do. It means that I can be content in whatever situation because I've learned the contentment. I've learned to rejoice when I start to feel discontentment, to rejoice in God, and to feel his peace in Christ Jesus. And then as a result of that, I don't say, well, my God can supply all my needs. I'm already at a place of contentment where I, I have seen him do that. But now I can intercede for others. My God shall supply all your needs according to the riches that are in Christ Jesus. I've pointed this out before. When you go through the New Testament, you'll never find the word saint in the singular. It's always in the plural. We need to be praying for each other. We need to be interceding for each other. But you'll intercede best from a place of contentment. And Paul gives us the steps to do that. Friends, if there's something that I can intercede for you, that I can pray with you about, or if you've got questions, I would love to be able to do that. You can leave it as a comment below. But I pray that you learn, just like Paul did, what true contentment is, that you would know the peace of God that comes from being in Christ Jesus. You would know the strength of being in, in Jesus. You would know the sufficiency that comes from Jesus so that you too can be an intercessor. You can pray for others. My God will supply all your needs. God bless you, friends.